Praise God for the praise and worship we just enjoyed. I don't know about you, but that just, uh, that fills a need uh, to worship our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's risen. He's risen. Let's not just say that on Easter. Let's say that every day, because if He is not risen, then our hope is in vain. Our faith is in vain. We're dead in our sins. Oh, wow, it's so good to know that he's risen and worship him. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, as we now open your word, we ask for spiritual hearts that can spiritually discern what you have to say to us. And so, Lord, fill this place, fill our hearts, fill our minds, and may you speak powerfully to us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. So again, welcome. If you're watching us by live stream or recorded message later, we want to welcome you as well, and, and welcome to everybody that's here. We, we here at Wasatch, even those of us that, that were here when we first started attending again, are still learning a lot of new names, so please be patient with us. But we're just gr- so glad to continue to see our family here at Wasatch Hills grow, and so we welcome you. Our message today... The golden rule, faith-seeking understanding, uh, a, a phrase made famous by uh, a, a leader, a spiritual leader many years ago, kind of, kind of just a phrase that is just common. You've heard it somewhere before, but I seek to give it some new meaning, some different meaning, because I think it's the phrase that fits this passage best. Of course, you know the golden rule. Everybody knows the golden rule. It's right here. He who has the gold makes the rules, right? I think if I went downtown Main Street, Salt Lake City, and asked people what's the golden rule, some people would say that. Other people would say different things like, um, don't do to somebody what you wouldn't want to have done to you. That's the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Somebody else might say. But here it is in the English Standard Version, part of the Sermon on the Mount. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this, Jesus says, is the law and the prophets. There's a lot there. Now, the challenge with the golden rule, if you've ever tried to live it, is it's not as easy to do as you think it is. For example... This relationship thing, this do to others as, uh, let me see, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, um, doesn't always seem to apply as easily as we might think. For example, when I first met my wife, I got permission for this. (laughs) Have you ever seen that YouTube video, Before He Speaks, but your pastor's wife's down in Florida? Maybe the next time he'll think before he speaks. Yeah, yeah, I got permission. But that still doesn't mean I might not get in trouble. But when I first met my wife, I thought we could read each other's minds. From the moment I walked into her typing class with my Nikon camera around my neck, taking pictures for the Mount Ellis Academy yearbook, uh, and she saw me from across the crowded room, I thought we could read each other's minds. And throughout most of our dating life, it seemed like, yeah, we were always in sync, always understanding each other, and and, and life was very easy and very simple, and then we got married about four years later, not in high school. (laughs) Then we got married four years later, and I thought I had this all figured out. I knew what she liked, I knew what she wanted, because it was whatever I liked and it was whatever I wanted. And then I discovered something very profound, and that was that doing to her what I would want done to me didn't always work. In fact, sometimes it really created problems in my life. And as Forrest Gump once said, uh, that's all I've got to say about that. So I'm not going to say any more about that. But one of the things that we find is when we try to apply it, it doesn't always seem to work. And the question then might be, okay, so, so what is it? Why is it that, that this teaching of Jesus, which sounds so simple, so basic, it's just the golden rule, 
And by the way, it's a rule that many people have accepted as a rule of faith without accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior, without even believing in a creator God. They've said, I think that's a good rule to follow. I'll just treat people the way I would like to be treated. It's simple. And yet in practical application, we find over and over and over again, especially even more so, I think, in our modern age, that when you treat people the way you would want to be treated, you still get it wrong. So how do we solve this? Well, maybe what we want to do is we want to look and say, okay, how, where did this, this idea that Jesus shares originate, and, and how does his idea compare to other ideas that we see out there in, in religion and in philosophy and those kinds of places? And we see many parallels historically. For example, Hillel, who was a Jewish scholar, a teacher, a rabbi within Judaism, says this, what is hateful to yourself, do to no other. That is the whole law, and the rest is commentary. Go and learn. Okay, good advice. Sounds similar to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. But do you notice something different? What's the difference between the, the kind of the expression of Hillel and the expression of Jesus? What's different there? Okay, one's a negative, right? Hillel's is a negative. What is hateful to yourself, do not. To others, do to no other, sorry. Whereas Jesus says, whatever you wish, do. Hillel's is negative. Jesus is in the positive, but it's sort of saying a similar thing. Notice this, Confucius. What you do not want done to yourself, do not do to others. Good advice. Compare again to Jesus' teaching. What, are, what makes them different? Same deal, right? Confucius puts it in the negative voice, and Jesus puts it in the positive voice. So here's another one. This is from Buddhist hymns of faith. Putting oneself in the place of others, kill not, nor cause to kill. How does this compare to the teaching of Jesus? Same deal. This one, too, puts it in the negative when Jesus puts it in the positive. And here's the amazing thing about what Jesus says that day in the Sermon on the Mount. First time that that kind of idea, that kind of teaching, is stated not in some negative sense of don't do to others what you don't want done to you, but is instead said in this positive voice, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, now what's the difference between saying it in the negative versus saying it in the positive? I mean, it really sort of says the same thing. Does it? Here's one of the fascinating things. One saying is telling you what not to do. Which, by the way, you could keep those negative teachings very easily by not doing anything. Right? You could keep those just by sitting in your sofa every day watching TV. I mean, uh, Netflix. Does anybody have a TV anymore? What is a TV? You could do those without doing anything. Whereas when Jesus challenges us, he actually puts us to work. And that's... Part of the challenge. The Apostle Paul took this idea, and he spoke on this similar issue, but notice that Paul seems to emphasize the negative. Oh, no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves one another, another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Now, Paul does something fascinating because I've highlighted words here on purpose. I, I kind of want to mislead you a little bit here at the beginning. I do that sometimes um, because an idea is more powerful when we focus on one part, and, but we miss the other part. And what we see here is Paul emphasizes a negative. You shall not, you shall not, you shall not, you shall not. Love does no wrong. Paul seems to emphasize negative, but he, there's a balance in this teaching. There's a powerful balance in this teaching that we don't see in the Buddhist hymn. We don't see in Confucius. We, we, do, we don't see in Hillel. But we see it in Jesus. A balance, a difference. Let's take a look at that balance. 
Here's the balance highlighted. Love each other. For the one who loves has fulfilled the law. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. This is going to sound really bizarre, but after four years of dating my wife and then marrying her, I didn't love her. I didn't. I loved me. I loved how she made me feel. I loved how I felt when I was around her. I loved how she looked because I loved how I looked when she was with me. But I didn't love her. True. True story. I didn't love my wife for eight years. And one day I went to a marriage conference, one of the Family Life Marriage Conferences, or the Weekend to Remember Marriage Conference. Write that down if you, if you need help loving somebody. And I went to one of those conferences, and I was sitting at a table at a restaurant in Lansing, Michigan, across from Becky, when I fell in love. And the reason I fell in love was because I was doing an assignment for the Weekend to Remember Family Life Marriage Conference. We were doing a communication assignment, and I was listening to her. And she was saying words. Yeah. I was like, wow, she says words. She's not just another pretty face. There's a human being inside of this person. And I don't know any other way to explain it than that when it suddenly hit me of who she really was, because I was now listening, I wanted to snatch her up into my arms and run her away from this public scene as fast as I could so that nobody would steal her from me. I mean, I felt like I had found a treasure. It's like, mine. <laughs> I want to keep this person. Person. Not object. Person. I fell in love because I knew. I had relationship. I understood. See, Paul points out something very powerful in Romans 13. In the first century New Testament context, he points us back to the Old Testament and he says, yeah, you know the Old Testament. You know the you shall not, you shall not, you shall not. You know the negatives. But I want to show you how to genuinely not do the negatives. Jesus does this in the Sermon on the Mount, too. You have heard that it was said, don't kill. If you harbor hatred in your heart towards somebody, you're a murderer. Do not commit adultery, but if you harbor lust in your heart for someone, you are an adulterer. Jesus takes us right to the matter of the heart, and he says it's not enough for you to not do certain things. I want something to come out from within you that, that is the result of a transformed heart. Paul gets this teaching of Jesus, and he says, love each other. Oh, no one anything. <clears throat> I want to show you this in the NIV. I love how the NIV re renders this. Oh, no one anything. Um, this one says, let no debt remain outstanding. It uses this language of borrowing something. And it says, you know, if you borrow, pay back. You know, it, it, this, is, this is a very uh, Dave Ramsey kind of verse. You know, snowball that thing. Right? If you're in debt, get out the debt snowball and get rid of your debt. But don't get rid of this debt. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love. Now, here's a question that I have when I read a verse like this. Why would I have a debt to love? How do you acquire debt? How do you become indebted? There's only one way to become indebted, and that is to borrow, to receive, to, 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 to take into your possession something that you do not deserve, you do not have, does not belong to you, it's not yours. You receive it from somebody else, and now you have it. But you owe it. And what's fascinating about this verse is we have God speaking, speaking to us through the Apostle Paul. And he's saying, okay, you, you have received the love of God in the sacrifice of Jesus for your sins. For you. Jesus is God's gift of love to you. You have received his gift. And with his gift, you have received grace. 
you guys see me do something weird during song service? I was sitting out here on the front row, my hand went up. I tried to pull it down several times, but it, it just kept going up. And it kept going up because Jesus is real to me. And it doesn't mean that he's not real to you. If your hands are down, that doesn't mean he's not real to you. It just, it's probably the culture you grew up in. I grew up in that culture too. I get it. But there's something about me putting my hand up that, that it, it helps me acknowledge that he's real. That he's present. And there's this debt that I feel. I've received grace. I've received love. I have been embraced and received while I was his enemy. And what else can I do but give it back to him in praise and worship? Thank you so much for leading us to, to that throne of grace this morning. In praise and worship and in the continuing debt to love one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. Quoting Leviticus, of all places. Not just a New Testament concept. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does, not, does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. You really want to keep the law? You need this love. Now, in the first century, when Jesus was <clears throat> preaching and teaching, there were two groups of people in his world, in his, in his culture, among the, within the religious world. There were the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And that's why they called them Sadducees, because if you don't believe in resurrection, you are sad, you see. <laughs> that one never gets old. Hashtag dad joke. I'm sorry, you guys. Um, I do that sometimes. Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And they come to Jesus with this hypothetical, you know, this man marries, uh, this woman marries this guy and he dies and she does the Leverite thing and marries his brother and he dies and so on and so forth. And there's seven husbands. So in the resurrection, whose husband is she? Jesus solved that one for me if there's really a resurrection. And Jesus says, yeah, you guys really don't know what you're talking about, do you? You don't know the Bible you don't know Scripture. You don't know how God's really going to do things. Gives them that answer. And the Pharisees are pretty amazed by that. They're like, wow, he really made those Sadducees look funny. But he won't make us look funny. And so they approached Jesus, and when the Pharisees had heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and they said, I bet we can ask him a good one. He won't be able to make us look foolish. We are Pharisees. And one of them, a lawyer... Huh, Mm. Lawyers. Yeah, those guys. A lawyer asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Mm, this will get him. And he said, You shall love the Lord your God <clears throat> with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. I want you to think about something here. I'm going to be careful. I'm going to try to be careful. Which one of those two are emphasized the most within society today? Love the Lord your God or love your neighbor as yourself? Which is more mainstream? Love your neighbor, right? Love your neighbor is, is extremely mainstream. How mainstream is love the Lord your God with all your heart? So one of the things that happens in Scripture is, is we have... Almost always, two things held in some kind of tension with one another. And there's a reason for that. I had a professor once in seminary. I know I've shared this with you before, but I'll share it with you again. I had this professor in seminary who started a class one day by saying heresy is truth. Remember that story? Some of you have heard it before. 
I have to keep reminding myself of that, and I have to keep reminding you of that. Heresy is truth. And, and there was a whole classroom full of pastors, and we heard our, our beloved professors say heresy is truth, and we, we were ready to walk out of the room. Because I'm pretty sure saying heresy is truth is heresy. And, of course, he knew that, too. He's an incredibly brilliant man. And so he paused. Heresy is truth. Pause for effect. And we're all freaking out, ready to take him on, ready to disagree. You argue with your professors in seminary. At least you did 30 years ago. I don't know what you do now. And then he said this. After we were ready to exit the room or take him on, he said, out of balance. Heresy is truth out of balance. And then he went on to say, heresy is not teaching falsehood. It's teaching truths out of balance with other truths. And when you teach one truth to the exclusion of other truths, you teach heresy. For example, if you teach love your neighbor as yourself without teaching love the Lord your God with all your heart, it's a heresy. It's out of balance. And not only that, it doesn't work. You can't do it without loving the Lord your God with all your heart. Yeah. That becomes so deeply ingrained in the Christian world that the Apostle Paul begins his address to his, his audience on this statement. Romans 12, this is all from Romans, by the way, if you haven't noticed. Beloved. He calls them Beloved. Beloved, this is, this is in Greek, this is the, the vocative in Greek grammar. It's the vocative. It is a noun that is actually a verb that has been modified into a noun by, by its, its ending into a noun. And it is beloved, vocative, as in vocation. As in a name you would call somebody, but not just a name that you would call somebody, a call that somebody has received upon themselves. Like I said before, you can't love unless you've been loved. You don't have love unless you have borrowed it at a very high interest rate from God Almighty. And so you never want to stop paying back that debt. It's a continuous debt, Paul said in the previous verse there. It's a continuous debt to love, and, and you can never pay it off. You're not supposed to ever pay it off. It's supposed to just flow through you and flow through you and flow through you, and it's not your own money. You're not paying this by your own works. It's something you have received, and it flows through you. You are beloved. The, the Greek word, the root word, agape. Agape toss, beloved, vocative. Those of you who have been loved are now the beloved, and the beloved love. Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. Question, do we live in a world that still wants vengeance? Do we live in a world that says love your neighbor and still demands vengeance? Truth. Out of balance? Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. If you want to know about the wrath of God, read Romans 1. The wrath of God is the, the broken-hearted wrath of a lover who has been abandoned for another love. And what can a lover do when they have been abandoned by another love except let them go? God gave them over, Paul says in Romans 1. That's all he can do. That's what God's wrath does. He gives us up to whatever we want to follow instead of him. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, what? Say it with me. Feed him. Feed him. Clement, Clement got you guys talking back. I saw you. You could do it. If your enemy is hungry, if he's thirsty, for by so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. So see, there's your vengeance. <laughs> yeah. We always read this one wrong because we don't understand what it's like in Old Testament times for somebody to rip their clothing and throw ashes on their head. We don't do that a whole lot in our day and age. But when somebody did that in ancient times, that was that person's way of saying, I am so undone. I am so broken. I am so wrong. The best way to prove somebody right is to take vengeance against them. 
Let's say, for example, they're saying you're a bad person, and you say, oh, no, I'm not. (laughs) Prove them right. Prove them wrong. You're a bad person. Oh, I see you're hungry. (laughs) Would you like a meal? You're a bad person. Oh, I see you're thirsty. Let me give you something to drink. Self-sacrificial love proves your enemy wrong. And when your enemy is proven wrong, your enemy is brought to repentance. And they heap burning coals upon their head. They they experience the the action of, of not only bringing to repentance, but burning coals. It not only brings them to repentance, it brings them to refinement. Fire, in the Old Testament context, in the New Testament context as well, is a refining process. It purifies. You actually help to bring purification and restoration to the world when, after having received as enemies of God the feeding and nourishment from Him that you so desperately needed, as after having been quenched of your thirst because of the incredible love of God, He has done this to you while you were still enemies with Him, you then pay that debt back in love to others. I love what's happening here. Beloved, (laughs) you have been loved and you love back, not just to God, but to your fellow man. And that sums up the law and the prophets. So Paul says this, I am under obligation. By the way, the Greek word, same Greek word as he says when he says, let no debt be outstanding. I am under obligation. I am indebted, Paul says. Paul understands that when he's received this from God, he's now indebted to everybody else. His relationship with God and the gift he has received from God ends up being the gift that he then shares with everybody. And he shocks his audience because it's one thing to say I'm obligated to my Jewish brethren, but it's another thing to say I am obligated both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. I am no respecter of persons. When it comes to paying back my obligation of making sure the love of God goes everywhere, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Paul goes to the center of the Jewish enemy, Rome, the Roman Empire, our oppressor. And he goes to Rome and he says, I'm obligated to Rome. You've got to feel the love. And so I'm going to come to you and I'm going to preach to you the gospel. And we tend to think that the gospel is Jesus died for my sins so that by faith in him I can be saved and go to heaven. That's the gospel. For Paul, it was way bigger than that. It was Jesus died and was buried and on the third day was raised and ascended to heaven and took his throne and began to reign and began to rule. And so the Roman Empire has zero power anymore. Jesus has all power and all authority have been given to him. Therefore, I'm I'm commanded to go and make disciples of every nation. That's the gospel. The gospel is a new king is on the throne. A new rulership is in charge. A new government is on his shoulders. And it's not the government of Rome. And so I'll walk right in on the political territory of the kingdoms of this world, and I will walk in there with an obligation to Greeks and to barbarians, to wise and to foolish. I don't care who they are. They've got to feel the love. How overwhelmed do you have to be with the love of God that you'll walk right into the den of your enemy and love that enemy? That's love, isn't it? I mean, that's real Love. What concerns me today is that a lot of people talk love, but there's always somebody they hate. And Jesus calls us to love enemies. Back to our verse. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law of and the prophets. This is what God was trying to get at all along. But saying it in the negative does not empower you to do it. It must be said in the positive. Remember the preface to this verse. So if you are evil and you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? Next verse. So 
whatever you wish others to do to you. Do you see there's a connection here between these two verses? What I talked about last week, about God being a good father and wanting to give good gifts to his children, and he doesn't always give us what we want. But to quote Mick Jagger, he always gives you what you need. Just checking, okay? I know who you are now. Rolling Stones fans. Whatever you wish others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Once you have received the love of God, once you have received good gifts from your Father who is in heaven, Luke's version, for God will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. That's the good gift. God will give you his presence. He will give you his abiding love. He will give you a clear and under perfect restorative, transformative knowledge of the risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And if he will give you that, then you're transformed and you love. You've received that gift and you give it. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is what the law and the prophets were trying to do with Israel all along. And it makes you wonder how many Canaanites would not have been slaughtered and decimated and utterly destroyed during the exodus and the, the occupation of Canaan had they loved instead of killed. I don't think that's God's problem. I think that's Israel's problem. We have an awesome little book, and I'm going to go over this fast because I know I'm, I'm going a little long today. It's called Mount of Blessing. Powerful little book. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. And it says this, In your association with others, put yourself in their place. Enter into their feelings, their difficulties, their disappointments, their joys, their sorrows. See, that's what happened at a restaurant in Lansing, Michigan, eight years after I got married. I was sitting across the table from somebody, and I had never put myself in her place. I'd never entered into her feelings. I'd never entered into her difficulties. I hadn't entered into her disappointments or her joys or her sorrows. I had never listened enough. I didn't have the communication skills to hear. And suddenly I did. And I discovered empathy. I felt what she felt. I knew who she was. Identify yourself with them and then do to them as were you to exchange places with them, you would wish them to deal with you. This is the true rule of honesty. Is there an emphasis in our world and in our culture today to speaking truth? Even speaking truth to power? This is the true rule of honesty. The true rule of honesty is to get to know people, even your enemies, so well that you feel what they feel, that you know what they know, that you experience what they experience, and suddenly you're not enemies anymore. It's a true rule of honesty. If you really want to be honest, if you really want to be real, know somebody deeply. It's another expression of the law. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The author continues. A religion that will lead us to be careless of human needs, suffering, or rights is a spurious religion. You hear that? <laughs> another, I, I've kind of beat up on the culture enough, the secular culture. Let's talk about Christians for a minute. Do Christians really care about human needs or sufferings or rights? Should. <laughs> Many do. But we kind of get this feeling sometimes like mainstream Christianity cares more, much more about their love and their allegiance to God and I will not be soiled by getting dirty with humanity. Heresy is truth out of balance. And we have spurious religion in our world today. In sliding the claims of the poor, the suffering, and the sinful, we are proving ourselves traitors of Christ. Google that word traitor, and you find that being a traitor means that you have betrayed the genuine king, that you have betrayed his government, his rulership, his authority, and instead you are somehow trying to establish a kingdom of your own. And this is the problem of Christianity today. The author goes on. It is because men take upon themselves the name of Christ while in the life they deny his character that Christianity has so little power in the world. 
The name of the Lord is blasphemed because of these things. Do you ever feel like Christians have zero influence or sway in what's going on in our world today? We don't have much. We don't even seem to have any leverage to speak. It's like, it's like the culture is saying, you know what, you've had enough time to ruin the world, thank you very much, and you really haven't done anything. So we're kind of done hearing you. And we'll take it from here, thank you very much. Christianity has little power in the world. This book was written around the turn of the century, the 19th and 20th century. Search heaven and earth, and there is no truth revealed more powerful than that which is made manifest in works of mercy to those who need our sympathy and aid. This is the truth as it is in Jesus. Have you ever gone to a revelation seminar and been told that the truth as it is in Jesus is to do works of mercy for people that are marginalized, people who are on the edges, people who are not receiving justice? Or are you told that truth and the truth as it is in Jesus is a set of propositions that you must describe to before we baptize you? I should have warned you to pick your feet up off the floor because I'm probably stepping on your toes. I know my toes hurt a lot right now. Okay, one more. When those who profess the name of Christ shall practice the principles of the golden rule, the same power will attend the gospel as in apostolic times. Have you ever wanted to enter this world and heal people like Jesus did? Have you ever wanted to walk down the street and bring restoration to people like those apostles did after Jesus ascended to heaven and took his throne and began to reign and rule over this world? Have you ever wondered why it worked then and it doesn't work now? We have somebody who listened to God a lot and wrote this book and says that when those who profess the name of Christ shall practice the principles of the golden rule, the same power will attend the gospel as an apostolic time. But the author also understands this very clearly. You have nothing to give in practicing the principles of the golden rule unless you have received the power of God practicing the golden rule on you. You've got to be with him. You've got to be alone with him. Let him search your heart. Let him explore the deepest depths of who you are. As if you were sitting at a, at a table in a restaurant in Lansing, Michigan, talking to your beloved. And they are probing the depths of your personhood and your heart and everything. And they're seeing everything in you. You become transparent. They can see right through you. And it's the most horrifying and terrifying and amazing thing all at once. Because he, our Lord Jesus, can see your sin, the word of God is powerful, penetrating to the, the separating of joints and marrow, soul and spirit. He judges the thoughts and the attitudes of your heart. And as he looks into you, he sees everything about you. And like the woman at the well, he loves you anyway. And what else can you do but run back into the village and say, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Every dirty, rotten, messy, horrible thing I ever did and loved me anyway. I've received so much love, I can't contain it all. I'm like a, a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I'm overflowing. And I can't help but give you some and to give you some and to give you some. And everybody in that village who receives that from the woman at the well suddenly says, okay, we've received from her, but let's go receive from him. If we have a dream for Wasatch Hills, it's that this facility on these Wasatch Hills would be a place where people who have encountered the presence of Jesus in your lives would then want to come and gather and encounter him in person for themselves. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did and loved me anyway. I think that is faith-seeking understanding.
Let's pray. Father in heaven, we have covered some territory with you today. I fear I've done it imperfectly. Um, I pray that some of these words of mine have been transformed into words of yours. I pray that you have spoken to our hearts, that you have convicted our spirits within us, that we have seen your love, and we are forever changed, transformed by the love of one who stretched out his arms and said, I love you this much, and died on the cross. Father, may that understanding be ours as we converse with one another following this service as we go out from this place through the parking lot and pass the parking lot into our community. And may we love with your love. I pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.